Hi everyone, Fran here and this video is going to talk you through uh, Northumberland as part of the Tudor course. Like with my Somerset video, before we look at any of the key questions that um, are raised as part of the Tudor course, I'm just going to talk you through who Northumberland is. Uh, and whilst he's not related to Edward in the way that Somerset was, um, he is an interesting character with a lot of relatives who appear on this course also. So John Dudley is in the middle of this family tree, if you like. He is referred to on our course most commonly as Northumberland, but prior to that title, he was the Earl of Warwick. So you might just want to keep in mind, especially when it comes to Tudor extracts, that John Dudley, Earl of Warwick, Northumberland, um, are likely to be referring to the same person if it is an Edward extract. Now, in terms of John Dudley's parents, um, Edmund Dudley is an individual you would be expected to know because he is uh, Dudley, as in Empson and Dudley, who we see under the reign of Henry VII um, in control of the council learned in the law. Um, so he comes from a family who have had high positions in government already. Looking down from Dudley to his children then, um, we've got Robert Dudley, who is going to be a especially significant figure when we look at Elizabeth. Um, and also we've got Lord Guildford Dudley, who we don't do as an individual necessarily, uh, but his wife, Lady Jane Grey, will be again of very high significance when we look at succession under Edward and the device. Dudley does have more children than this. I have just identified the ones who are going to be of particular, irrele uh, particular relevance sorry, to our course. Starting with the key question of government then, um, John Dudley does not take the title of Lord Protector, which is the title Somerset had had whilst um, looking after Edward, ruling on his behalf. And that's because Dudley wants his working atmosphere to be more conciliar and what we mean by that term is he wants to work alongside a council and have other people's input into policies that are um, decided and therefore he doesn't want to be autocratic um, which means you are an individual who essentially makes decisions by yourself uh, which had been the case under Somerset. So what happens is John Dudley rejects the title Lord Protector and he becomes instead Lord President of the Council. It's in the following year that he gets the title Duke of Northumberland and from now on I will refer to John Dudley as Northumberland. In terms of a way to remember a government under Northumberland, the easiest way to remember it is a tale of four coups. Full credit to Tom Dixon for this. Um, so. There are essentially four coups in the years 1549 to 1553. The first one is where Northumberland takes over from Somerset following the rebellions in 1549, which are the Western Rebellion and Ketz Rebellion. Um, he had done this with the support of not only councillors such as Arundel, Southampton and Cramner, but also of Edward. So whilst it is a takeover of power, um, he did have support from council members and the king. Coup number two is where Northumberland increases his power further by sacking conservatives and by conservative we mean religiously conservative uh, individuals such as Arundel and Southampton and these were replaced with reformists such as the Marquis of Dorset and the Bishop of Ely. Uh, Northumberland will also make um, Sir John Gates um, a member of the council and he will be described as the enforcer. Coup number three is one of the, I would say one of the better coups if you want, in the sense of how badly it goes, in that Somerset decides he wants to get his old job back. So please remember at the point where Somerset falls from power and he loses his position as Lord Protector, he isn't executed in that moment. He's actually readmitted, which means rejoins the council. Um, and it's in that position that he sort of looks around and decides he wants his old job back. However, Northumberland became aware of this. He used trickery to 
um, essentially catch Somerset out. And it's in the wake of that coup, that sort of attempt to regain his position that Somerset is executed. What happens next is somewhat ironic in that I started this slide by saying that Dudley wants to be less autocratic than Somerset. He wants to have a conciliate working environment. But it's from this point that he actually becomes more like Somerset. Um, he tends to rule without the help, uh, with the help of just one advisor, sorry, Sir John Gates. Um, only them two had access to the dry stamp. Um, so it's quite ironic that Somerset kind of challenging Northumberland's power by trying to regain his position, whilst it is unsuccessful, it does make Northumberland more like Somerset in his approach to government. Coup number four is one we're going to look at in a lot more detail later down the line, so I'm just going to give you a very brief overview. Coup number four is the failed attempt upon Edward's death, um, a failed attempt by Northumberland to put Lady Jane Grey on the throne instead of Mary. Whilst Lady Jane Grey will be queen for nine days, um, she will not stay as queen and Mary will take over. Uh, and this event is called the device and will be discussed when we do succession. Next, we are going to look at foreign policy. I'm not going to just read out this slide because you can pause this slide if you want to take note of any details. I'm going to try and group together some events that happen so that we can see some big picture um, points about whether foreign policy moves in the right or the wrong direction. In terms of France, there are definitely moves in the right direction in that Northumberland pursues a policy of peace. And this will culminate with the Treaty of Boulogne, where England will lose Boulogne, but it will be in exchange for £133,333 from France, alongside the French taking their troops out of Scotland and a defensive alliance between England and France. Now, whilst England has lost some land in France and it now only really has Calais on the mainland that is, is theirs. Given what they receive in exchange for that land, you could argue it was the right decision and that losing Boulogne was certainly not a crisis at this point. In terms of relations with Charles, the, Charles V, they're certainly more bumpy. Charles orders a Catholic Inquisition in the Netherlands, which saw essentially Catholics rounded up and interrogated. And this does lead to a temporary embargo by England onto sale of cloth in the Netherlands. Um, however, this is temporary and trading relations will improve. So whilst it is a moment of tension, I don't think many would go so far as to say that that was a crisis given its temporary nature. And given that when we look at economy, it only affects certain parts of England. Then finally, in terms of Scotland, again, we get a move in the direction of peace in that a joint commission is installed and agrees upon the boundary between Scotland and England. However, this should not be taken to assume that everything is sort of rosy. English defences are still very on a very high level. £200,000 is spent every year um, on the Navy and on garrisons on the Scottish border. So. I think when you put France, Scotland and Spain together and you look at foreign policy as an entirety, um, there are definitely moves in the di right direction, especially with Scotland and France. I would say that it's not a complete success. You could say that is partly due to the situation Northumberland inherits. Um, but on the whole, I don't think many would look at these series of bullet, po of bullet points, this timeline and say there is a crisis. In terms of Northumberland then and religion, uh, whilst Northumberland is a man of few religious convictions, what's quite interesting is that he will make some quite significant moves in the direction of Protestantism. In 1551, um, Catholic bishops are replaced with Protestant bishops. And please pause the screen to make sure you've got down examples of individuals who are replaced and who uh, replaces them. In 1552, Parliament meets and passes a New Treason Act, which made it an offence to question the royal supremacy or Church of England beliefs. You get the Second Act of Uniformity, which made it an offence for clergy not to attend Church of England services. And then you get key changes to the Second Book of Common Prayer. Now, these changes to the Second Common Book of Prayer are in the table, but collectively they are moves to make the church more simple. 
Um, there's rewritings of services, including baptism, confirmation, burial, purpose vestments are banned, which is a move towards simplicity. Music's restricted, another move towards simplicity. And wafer is replaced with ordinary bread. Uh, and that specifically can be seen as an influence of Zwinglianism, which is a somewhat radical form of Protestantism. Zwingli actually disagreed with Martin Luther on a lot of issues and can be seen as more radical in his Protestantism than Martin Luther was. And then in 1553, we get the 42 Articles of Religion, um, which are published by Cramner and are again very considered considerably Protestant in terms of the doctrines of the church, which are the beliefs of the church. Two things are very important here. One, which I've kind of hinted at, that it's interesting that a man with few religious convictions makes, makes such substantial changes to the church. But what is also interesting is that this doesn't spark rebellion, which given that Somerset's Book of Common Prayer did, despite being more moderate than this, um, can lead to interesting questions and debates as to why this doesn't spark rebellion. A final um, issue concerning religion that we can look at at this point in the course is how far English people are becoming Protestant. So when you are asked essays, when you ask the extracts uh, that concern religion under Edward, please um, keep a strong eye out for phrasing because the question about the religious status of the country versus the religious uh, sort of convictions of the people are two very separate um, questions that would require different information. So this slide is telling you whether everyday people like you and me living in England, were they Protestant, were they Catholic in terms of their beliefs? I'm not gonna read through all of these points, but you can pause the slide at this point and kind of gather the evidence on both sides. Um, and I think another point you can couple into this is the next video I will do on Mary, uh, and how people react to her um, move back to Catholicism can also give you a good indication as to how Protestant or how Catholic the English people were. In terms of the economy then, um, financially there had been hardship under Somerset, however Northumberland does manage to make positive, move, positive moves when it comes to finance. Um, the end to the war with France and Scotland had led to uh, Northumberland raising the £133,333 in return for Boulogne, so that's more income for England. There is one debasement by Northumberland, however, after that point, he reverses the process and he actually begins reminting the coins, which is where you put more precious metal into coins as to reducing it, uh, and that is also to tackle inflation. The consequence of his reminting of the coinage is that the silver finest, so the amount of silver in a coin had returned to pre-debasement levels um, and that percentage is 92.5% fine silver, which again is a positive move and that's going to help with inflation. Crown income improves because there is more melting down of church plates. Again, Northumberland does take a more radically Protestant approach to religion, which means that the um, that England is able to raise more finances through processes such as selling off chanteries, uh, pillaging churches, melting down church plate. So you may want to debate whether um, that is maybe the best approach, but nonetheless, it does see more finance brought into England. Um, and finally, Mild May commissions, um, sorry, he undertakes a commission to analyse finance to see what the situation is when it comes to finance in England. However, it's under Mary that we see the benefits of that commission. In terms of employment, uh, the new Treason Act reimposes censors censorship to try and maintain law and order. Um, there is a, a moment where the cloth trade collapses we saw under foreign policy, but again, it is only temporary. And if you look at this, it is mainly East Anglia and the West of England that are affected, so it's not a national issue per se. And then we get the new poor law, uh, which gives Paris parishes responsibility to collect funds for the deserving slash impotent poor, so those who are poor through no fault of their own. In terms of agriculture, the sheep tax is repealed. However, anti-enclosure sort of laws and principles are still in force. We've got a bit of a middle ground there. Um, and then in terms of exploration, 
Northumberland does encourage explorers to search out new routes and develop trade. Um, we get a trade company set up under Sebastian Cabot uh, and the Privy Council members invest £25 each into the scheme. There is some success um, at various points. Um, however, what we need to remember at this point is that um, it's under Elizabeth that we're going to see sort of the real benefit of these companies that are set up and kind of the impact of the work they do. So again, I've maybe paused this slide to get any extra information, but the general picture when it comes to economy is again, moves are going in the right direction. It might not be a overwhelming success, but you would argue for the most part, uh, Northumberland is addressing the issues he inherited. Last of all, then we've got the succession issue and the device. Henry VIII's will stated that should Edward die, Princess Mary should take over as queen, uh, especially if Edward has no heir to the throne, which was the case. Um, this is an issue for Northumberland because Northumberland is a somewhat radical Protestant, as echoed in his religious changes, and Mary is a Catholic. And what this means is that his career is essentially on the line here. So what Northumberland does is he changes the succession. He makes Lady Jane Grey, Grey his daughter-in-law, um, the successor to Edward, so next in line. Um, this is partly because, uh, as noted, that she is married to his son, so his career is not as in jeopardy as it would be under Mary. Mary and Elizabeth, as in Mary I and Elizabeth, were um, declared illegitimate. And ultimately, this, in order to fully work, would need to go through Parliament so that a succession act could be passed. However, Edward died before Parliament could be summoned. So this, this act through Parliament has not taken place. This means that when Northumberland makes Lady Jane Grey Queen of England, not only is this dubious in terms of legitimacy but there is no legal backing to this decision and no legal force that he can use to enforce this decision. It takes Northumberland three days to declare Lady Jane Grey Queen um, and as we see when Mary takes over she's got a lot of supporters behind her because she is next in line to the throne legitimately um, and essentially after nine days is able to take the throne. In terms of why this fails ultimately, Northumberland's interfered with a very legitimate succession to try and hold on to power. And in a nutshell, it was illegal. So that is kind of the nutshell answer as to why this didn't work. There's a debate on who is responsible. Some people think that Edward is responsible as a radical Protestant, anxious that his sister may change things back to Catholicism. However, some people think that uh, it was actually Gates, the enforcer of Northumberland, who should be given a bit more credit for this decision um, and that Edward's change in thought process might not have been as much as it, of his own thoughts as we think. Huge thank you to Fran for that excellent video. Uh, lots of really, really good uh, detail on Edward's reign, uh, particular emphasis obviously on uh, Northumberland and the key role he plays and all those in interesting stuff with the device and all the rest of it. This is a huge uh, Im important part of the story of the, of the Tudors and this playlist is looking at the Tudors all the way through from Henry VII through Henry VIII through Edward and Mary in the middle and then on to Elizabeth. So we're looking to cover the whole Tudor period period designed to support A-level students doing 1C. Uh, if you like this and you want more of the same and you want to find out more about this, then uh, subscribe and you'll get notifications as we add more material. Big thank you again to Fran.